Hello, everyone. This is Noah Taublieb, also known as That Sound Design Guy, and I'm here with Sound Font Guy for a interview. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Well, let's get right into it. So I have some questions for you. Um, first of all, as the resident expert of all things sound font related, can you tell us what a sound font is and how it's made? Well, that's... Um... Well, it's very kind. I don't know that I would necessarily consider myself an expert, um, more of an enthusiast uh, with aspirations to be an expert, I'm sure. Um, I guess to put it simply, a sound font is sort of a um, an early type of uh, virtual instrument. It consists of like usually small samples to sort of approximate the sound of an instrument. Okay. So, and how did you, with, and then... What DAWs and plugins do you use when you're using sound fonts and sound font and making sound font based music? I know personally, I've been using Logic Pro with the TX16 WX plugin, and uh, I like Gameverb for reverb. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm a longtime FL Studio user. Um, it's it's my personal favorite, although I do have uh, experience with Pro Tools, um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, FL Studio has its its built in sound font player that they reintroduced a couple of years ago, which is great. And um, I use uh, another program called um, Isotope RX10, which I use specifically for like editing and manipulating the samples that I'll use um, to create the sound fonts. Interesting. And then for yeah, and then for the actual sound font creation, when I'm putting the samples together um, into the container, I use I mostly use Polyphone. I sometimes use Vienna. Um, but mainly Polyphone for that. All right. Can you uh, give us an example of how you use RX10 specifically on a sound font? Like what aspects have you used it for or what does it do specifically? Yeah, sure. Um, so you can you can use it to sort of EQ, um, you know, equalize or, or change um, the pitch. You can use it for noise removal. Um, I have a lot of little instruments around here. And when I'm making a sound font, I might record a single note from a guitar. Uh, but there may be some background noise that that squeezes in, and RX10 kind of has is a very powerful tool for like cleaning up a sound and making it you know nice and usable. Got it. Um. So how did you get interested in sound fonts, and what inspired you to start creating them and selling them commercially on your Ko-Fi page? Oh wow, that's a great question. Um. Well, I've been a uh, composer for. For games, largely indie games and some film and things like that for uh, 15 or so years now. And I got my start mainly because I didn't have very much money, but there were a lot of video game based sound fonts on the internet for free. And so that kind of got me interested. I was like, I had tools that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to use, you know, because plugins can be expensive, software can be expensive. And so it was nice to have like a, a wealth of tools to use um, that were all free. And eventually I got to the point where I, I started thinking, well, if some people can extract these sounds from games, I can do it too. And then I started to extract them not terribly long ago, really, um, maybe just a couple of years ago. And then uh, it came to my attention that that's, you know, that's kind of a slippery slope. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll create, you know, I'll create sound fonts that are inspired by games and nobody will have to worry about copyright issues and things like that. And that's why I usually offer a, a free version and a paid version for like a little bit of higher quality. Right. And that actually leads me into my next two questions. The first one is you mentioned like how you use sound fonts in part to save on more expensive plugins and because it helped with video game and because like there are such great video game sources. But why are sound fonts so linked with video games in particular? I know that you can make sound fonts on technically anything and how there are other and you can make a sound font on based on just specific equipment. Why is why are video games always like the center of sound font discussion, at least that I've seen? I think it's because um, the the sort of popular era of of video game music, which is like Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64 and playstation um, and a little bit into the next generation as well but those platforms use a format or a protocol that's very similar to sound font 
um, in that they use like small pre-recorded samples to sort of approximate the sound of a real instrument. And I think that because when extracting those sounds from games, people usually just convert them to the official sound font format. It's it's very common to associate them because they're just they're so very, very similar. That makes sense. So and and the other question that what you previously said was leading into, um, and I know you have a video on this already going over the legalities of video game sound fonts, but I guess I was curious because you make you actually have a service where, you know, you extract or not extract, you replicate sound fonts from video games but you make them your own and are thus legally distinct. How are they legally distinct? Well, they don't actually use any material from the game that they're inspired by. Um, this could actually be quite challenging because so many of the music softwares out there actually prohibit the use of their software for the creation of sample packs and sound fonts and things like that. So there's a very narrow pool of, of things to choose from. And uh, because of that, I sort of find myself, you know, um, having to be like very creative and oftentimes creating most sounds either from the ground up or using things that are in the public domain. And so by using those tools and, and those resources, that that's what makes it legally distinct. OK, so like, could you walk us through a short example for, for example, I know you did a, the Silent Hill 1 sound font like. Um, so like walk us through what it took like to replicate a basic pad. Oh yeah. That's a great question. Um, replicating pads is probably one of my favorite hobbies with regard, like sub hobbies within the hobby of sound font creation. Um, so with a, with a pad an ambient pad sound, what I'll, what I'll often do is I'll, I'll just sort of listen to it and get a good feel for it. And most of them are chords. So if you can identify the chord that's being played, you can start there. and you sort of can get a feel for the texture. Like, does this sound like, is this a bell? Is it a string ensemble? And once you kind of have an understanding of which sort of instruments they might be, you can start with those. And um, usually I'll do something where I, I will take a, a snapshot of what the, um, what the audio spectrum looks like for the pad that I'm trying to recreate. And I'll look at it and I'll actually do some sort of like visual sound design where I'm like, okay, well, what does my spectrum look like? Oh, okay, well, I see there's some gaps here and this, this is a little too loud and I'll just kind of, you know, slowly sort of sculpt it. Interesting. And with all your expertise in the field, do you feel confident that you can replicate basically any sound there is? Or is there, if some, or is there something you feel like, oh, I could almost do this or is like, do you have any limitations in that regard? That's a good question. Um, I think that ultimately the, the most difficult sounds to recreate are the more simple sounds. Um, you know, if I hear a, a single note of a, of a piano that has a very particular timbre that I like, to recreate that timbre is very difficult because, you know, pads, you can just, you can add more. You can, you can add more texture and create more, but if you're going the other direction, there's only so much you can take away, you know, before something starts to sound thin or empty. Right. So with all that in mind, how long does it take you to make a sound font that you then sell commercially, like beginning to end? Well, it can vary. Um, some of the smaller ones, I would say, if I'm consistently working on it, you know, without, uh, without interruptions, probably seven to 10 days. Uh, the bigger ones, probably closer to a month. Got it. Uh, speaking of the bigger ones, I know you're, technic you're still sort of fundraising for a Silent Hill 2 sound font. And yes. I know, you and I'm very much looking forward to when, I when that eventually gets around. Um, and like, because that would seem to be like on the bigger scale project. Like, so does that make like, because I know you specialize particularly in Super Nintendo, PlayStation 1, Nintendo 64, roughly that era of sounds, though I know you can do anything. Does the, is replicating PS2 sounds like particularly difficult? 
Um, as compared to like PS1 or the previous generation, yes. Yes, it, it's a little bit more difficult in that the the sounds of the PlayStation 2 era are much higher fidelity. They they sound a lot better. You know, they didn't have to squeeze tiny little samples into, you know, a smaller space. So they had a lot more room to work. And, you know, on the one hand, that does give me more room to work with, but it also means that there's a lot more room for error. Got it. Um, so... Now, I also know that you have a service on your Ko-Fi page where people can actually commission you to make specific sound fonts. I know I've actually made such requests in the past. Um, so can people make a sound font request for more modern games? Like, say you wanted something based on a new indie game or, or just any sort of recent product? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that's a great question because... I think people often associate sound fonts with with older games, but really it just comes down to, you know, sampling and sound design, and that can really be done for sounds of any generation. Okay. Um, now, given that sound fonts rely heavily on MIDI data, do you see any value of using, of using MIDI data or as, sorry, do you see any value of using MIDI data to visualize your work? Because there are programs like Keysight or piano VFX, or if you, I'm sure you've been on YouTube long enough to see like the old Synthesia videos or Sheet oh, yeah. Music Boss, any of that. Is that something you've ever considered with when making songs of your own with mini data? Or is that just like a extra thing that may not be worth the time? No, actually, um, that's, it's actually something that I'm, I'm quite a fan of. I really love the, the different types of visualizations, particularly for MIDI data. I often, if I do visualize, have a visualizer, it's usually more the audio data that I visualize. Oh. Um, though I think the, um, the MIDI data is, is kind of more entertaining because you can see the notes that are being played. And I know that even I myself have learned songs on the piano by watching a Synthesia video or something. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of value in that. And it's definitely something I would consider looking into for myself. Okay. Um, you know, I only recently myself learned what specific programs that have been developed recently for MIDI data visualization. I didn't know as much about audio visualization. Like in my research, I came across like turn your music into a, into a, turn your audio into a music video, Google ad, such and such and such. But sure. are there any particular programs in either audio visualize in either audio visualization or MIDI visualization? Sorry, bit of a bit of a tongue twister mouthful. Are there any programs in particular for either audio or MIDI visualization that particularly appeal to you? Yeah, so this is going to be a very basic answer. Um, FL Studio, which is this is going to be a very specialized portion of the answer, but FL Studio does come with its own built in visualizer that's highly customizable called Z Game Editor. Um, it has a lot of, uh, you know, MIDI activated types of graphics and also audio activated and it's it's very it's a very versatile tool um in terms of something that's a little bit more universal if you don't have fl studio um adobe after effects that's a that's a great one i know it can be a little bit pricey um if you're looking for something a little bit less pricey there's wallpaper engine which is um i think it's on steam now hmm. but that's another really good one and there are a, a million I can't remember the names of all of them. I'm sorry, but there are a million um, MIDI data visualizers that are that are all very good in their own right. Right. Um, so my next question is: Out of all the sound fonts you've currently developed, which ones are your favorite? Ooh, like my favorites. I think probably the Tactical Fantasy guy, the one that's based on Final Fantasy Tactics. That's one of my favorites, largely because that's one of my favorite game soundtracks, maybe ever. So to have been able to sort of recreate some of those sounds from scratch on my own is kind of a little point of pride. That, you know, that reminds me of the time when I discovered back when you're doing videos on your channel using the straight sound font rips and I heard your Final Fantasy tactics, the one, you know, at the time ripped from the game and I was like, oh, I can't find the link to this anymore. What happened? And you gave a great breakdown of the leak. So I was very excited to see the, the, act, 
the legally distinct version available. Um, that's what, and another thing about the, some of the content you've done in the past, I know recently you actually held a contest in your Discord server uh, based on the Solid Guy, Metal, the Metal Gear Solid 1 inspired sound font. Basically, where you encouraged your viewers to make some original music from the sound font you created, the free version. And I know you put out a video with some of the winners showing off their talent. Is that the sort of thing you might consider doing again for future sound fonts? Or do you have any other community-based events you might try to run? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, um, I have, it can be a little bit uh, challenging to coordinate this sort of thing because I, I try to get volunteer judges to help me with that. And, um, but I definitely have plans for another one in hopefully, hopefully the near future. Okay. And what's it like judging them? Like, I mean, I know you gave, you sort of gave it, you divided it into three categories. I believe it was most creative, most authentic, most memorable melody. So do you, do you have like, for example, in like, in certain sports, like, uh, like motocross or skateboarding, they have something like called the ISX system, where they actually like, like they actually measure each specific kind of trick, give it a very specific kind of point. Or are you more so going off vibes? Like, uh, I, I feel this one is memorable i feel this one's authentic or do you like try to mm. have a you have a rigid sort of x instrument was used this way therefore it is this level of authenticity to the base material wow that's a great question very thoughtful i think um it's it's definitely a mix of both and it helps to have sort of diverse opinions among the judges people who have different backgrounds and and different you know things that they look at. Some people are more theory minded while some are more about vibes. Um, I kind of fall in the middle. I like, uh, I like to hear, you know, creative uses and, uh, you know, I like when people sort of bend the rules. The criteria is not, it's not set in stone necessarily when, when I have something like that in place, it's not like, it's not very rigid to answer your question. It's more, it's a little bit of vibes. It's a little bit of like, did they do, you know, did they understand the assignment? But largely it's like, you know, music is for the listener and, you know, the, the first listener is the musician. So. Right. And have you ever had a disagreement with one of the judges you've worked with? Like, have one of you said, I think this song is the most memorable. The other person said, I think this song is the least memorable or any sort of that situation occur yet. I know you've only had the one contest so far. We did have. I wouldn't say that we had like a, any like strong disagreements. I think we all kind of knew which sort of handful were the ones that we wanted to choose from. We had, uh, we just kind of had differing opinions on who should be the winners. But it was very clear to us from the time that we started listening, um, like which, which ones were sort of like more favored versus not. Um, we just had some minor disagreements about like, you know, first and second place, that kind of thing. Got it. Um, so, but now here's a bit of a fun little question. How did you come up with your little character profile? The, the hooded figure with the little Cyclops eye and the X mouth. I think it kind of looks like a Mega Man legend sort of character, which I know is also a sound font you did. Yeah. Um, how did that come to be? Did you design them yourself? Hire an artist? Yeah. Um, so that guy is based on, he's sort of a combination of, um, a shy guy from the Mario series and a reaver bot from Mega Man Legends. They're, they're two of my, my favorite simple designs. And I thought like, well, maybe we could put these together. And so I, uh, reached out to this artist, um, Carpo Cottage, uh, who is full disclosure, my younger sister, um, and and she designed it sort of based on the concept, um, but I did not design it myself. I just kind of had an idea in mind, and and she drew it. Does she also do the cover art for all of your sound fonts? No, I do those myself in Photoshop. Oh, interesting. How'd you learn yeah. how to do that? Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Just kind of over time, just sort of messing around. You know, I mean, I had a YouTube channel some time ago that I was relatively active on, and you know, would 
practice making backgrounds for the music that I was putting on that channel or trying to make a, a thumbnail, which I still have not nailed making thumbnails, but that's all right. Yeah, I'm still working on that myself on my own channel. I, uh, I, I tried copying Sheet Music Boss's uh, format where they have, you know, the, they have the, they have their mini visualizer in the background, a character for whatever it is they're riffing on left, and like a bit of text in the middle. I tried doing a variation of that where same same kind of background. I ripped uh I ripped a PS1 copy of Solid Snake plastered his face on the right. Uh I didn't I couldn't think of any text to put in the middle uh because like it wasn't a straightforward piano tutorial, but that was the sort of thing I experimented with. Yeah, I saw I saw what you're referring to and I thought it looked really good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um and also that reminds me, so how did you get into um, talking about sound fonts on YouTube? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, it started with, um, it started with just kind of doing sound font covers. I, you know, my, my whole life is centered around music and video game music in particular. And so as a fan of things, I wanted to sort of do little crossovers and I, I thought I had the skills to do it. And then uh, I started, you know, I started to see the, um, well, let me take it back a step. There is a service, I don't recall the name of it right now, but there's a service that uh, composers and musicians can sign up for where you can sell your music to be used in video games. And it's, you know, it's not a ton of money or anything, but it's a it's a nice way to make a, a little extra buck if you have some music that you're proud of and, you know, you want to sell it. It's kind of like stock music, a stock music website for video games. Well, I learned that they do not accept any entries or applications from anyone who's using sound fonts that are ripped from video games because of the potential legal issues around them. And I... Up until that point, I never considered that there would be legal issues around using them. I never thought for a moment. But it turns out that most of those samples are actually owned by, you know, large companies that develop these, you know, softwares and hardwares that the sounds come from. And so using them without authorization from like, you know, Roland or Yamaha is, uh, you know, it's a pretty big violation. Right. So that's how I got into talking about it. I was like, well, let's, you know, let's inform people at least. I mean, I don't necessarily expect people to just change the whole way they're going about things, but they deserve to know. Right. And, and I guess I find that interesting because I know there are at least a few commercial products and famous individuals. I won't name who, because if you know, you know, and I don't want to be a snitch on accident, but I know there are at least a few documented cases of people using sound font rips in professional projects and being applauded for it. Mm -hmm. So I guess like there's sort of a murkiness, like obviously for the record, I am not encouraging anyone to use commercial sound font rips for commercial products because of the obvious legal like obligations. And if anyone does that after this interview, I am not liable, neither are you. Um, but I guess I find it interesting. Maybe it kind of goes back to, I think rap, how I think how rap music sometimes samples music. It's like, you're not supposed to, but sometimes you can get away with it, I guess. Yeah, the the law around sampling in general is is still very unclear. There's there's a lot of case law and precedent for for sort of um for copyright and fair use and things like that, but you you really just can't know. You really can't know and you don't know until you get sued. It's really the only way that you know for sure is if you get sued. Right. And how do these companies know you're ripping straight from games? Like, it might be obviously if you call it like, oh, I made this song that sounds like Metal Gear Solid. But I mean, but unless like you outright state it or unless you use a sample that's like very famous, I feel like it could be easy to, my, to maybe like input very subtle sound font usage because who has an encyclopedic memory of every video game sound there is? Sure, yeah. Well, it's... Uh... It's more likely, it's less likely to be from the developer or someone who worked on the game. And it's more likely to be a, an employee or, you know, an executive um, or even just an enthusiast of the source of the sound. 
Um, and the thing with these sounds is that because they're pre-recorded, they are owned by, you know, the company that recorded them. So if you have, you know, we were talking about a single key press of a piano. If you have a key press, a single key press of a piano sound that came from a Roland module that was pre-recorded, well, there are ways that you can, you know, first of all, they, they can be recognized. There are a lot of people, even just fans of video games who are like, that's the same piano, that's the same guitar, or that's the same flute. Kind of like, kind of like how like you can hear the almond break drum sample loop wherever yes. you go. Once you recognize it, you can't unhear it from wherever it pops up. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a great comparison, and you know something that that is a a fun little forensic sound design thing is that you can put that same if you hear a song and you recognize the piano, you can um, the piano sample I should say not the. Uh, not the performance, but right. if you're like, oh, that's that piano note sounds the same as this piano note from this other game. Well, if you were to overlay those two piano notes, then you would hear phasing because it's the same recording. And that would be how you would know that it's definitely from that, you know, synth or that module because it's it's an identical sound. And that's how they would get you. Right. Because I guess that's the methodology like Roland might use to differentiate how they like because they have like their online service where you can use digital Roland product sound alikes like the mm-hmm. S like the JV 1080 and such and such versus you could technically go to music artifacts and download a JV 1080 music sound font and mm-hmm. maybe that's how it and because there are very you know minute differences between the two but ones that it could be measured given one's an emulation one's based on the original hardware they could probably track you that way yeah and Ultimately, because they're they're sample based, excuse me. <clears throat> Ultimately, because they're sample based, they can they can cross reference them pretty easily and see that that's what they are. I mean, you can, you know, look at a waveform and like when you've been doing this kind of thing for a long time, you can see right away if two waveforms are the same sound. And so, you know, one popular one is uh, the Roland SC eighty eight, the Sound Canvas. Mm-hmm. Um, the the plugin was discontinued. The hardware was discontinued a long time ago, but there are still sound fonts of it floating all over. I mean, there's there's got to be ten different sound fonts that were made from this from this synth, and it's it's in a ton of games. But Roland has the ability to, if you're using something of theirs and you release it commercially, they can cross reference your name with their database of licenses. You you know if you uh, if you don't have a license to use the the sound then they they could slap you with a lawsuit if they wanted to they might not but they might right and come to think of it how come no how come like Roland hasn't gone after all these art all these sound fonts that are on music artifacts and like these other sources like is it kind of like how there's like like is it kind of like pirating movies and such? Like you could take down the one website that has them, but there's a billion others. That's a really good question. And I won't pretend that I have the absolute correct answer to this. Um, but I would speculate that it is similar to, to piracy in that way, or to maybe, um, emulation, you know, where there's ROM websites and stuff and, and they are starting to get taken down at a higher rate than they were before. And, Roland, Yamaha, these companies, they could come after websites like Musical Artifacts if they wanted to. Got it. So I guess it, it, I guess it exists in the same place emulation exists, in this very gray middle ground with some very light, with a lot of liability at stake, mm-hmm. which, which is why it's great that we have people like you making, the, making like these recreations that allow us to express through the works that inspired us, but in an obviously legal way. Sure, yeah. Well, thanks for saying that. It's very kind. <laughs> well, that, like, I mean, when I discovered your service, I became super invested. Thank you. Um, and you know, speaking of like companies policing um, content, you know, one thing I heard about recently was like them using AI search optimization or like AI bots to like scan the internet, or I think it was like ROMs or fan games or just general like auto detect copyright. You think they can make that kind of thing for audio tools? Uh, I'm certain that they could. Yeah. I think it's, uh, 
It's one of those things that's it's not particularly difficult to do. Um, they already have it in place for, you know, streaming services like, you know, Spotify and Apple Music and stuff like that. They they can do it if you are, you know, if you're performing a song that you that is already copyrighted by someone else. So if they can if they can do it for a 15 second snippet of a melody, I'm sure they can do it for for a single note of a synth. Right. And that actually sort of leads me into my other question. Have you ever considered using AI in any form whatsoever? Because like, obviously you don't need it for the sound fonts, but I know there are like, I've seen like plugins that are like AI recreation, like, like where you can technically, you know, feed it a piece of audio and it will technically make something distinct, like in essence of it, but I guess maybe legally distinct or obviously, and I, Granted, you don't need AI art because you have both your skills as a photo, as a Photoshop user, and your sister as a character designer. But I guess, like, has AI any tool whatsoever ever appealed to you, at least in this line of work? There are there are some AI tools that I use. Um, for example, there's there's an AI um, background noise remover. Um, it's called, uh, called clarity and mainly it's for like, you know, spoken word podcast, things like that. And, and it's just a dial and you turn the dial up and the AI identifies what's voice and what's not and removes that sort of thing that, that I, I will use. And I do encourage the use of that sort of thing. I actually, uh, I have something similar. I think it's called super clear, but maybe I got to look mm. into this one it might be better. Interesting. Yeah, no, I'm sure that they're um, they're likely on par with one another. Um, regarding AI overall, um, you know, as an artist, I have my reservations about it, but I also don't think that it's going anywhere, despite my reservations. So mm. I think that as creatives, it's sort of our job to to figure out how we can continue to create, not in spite of the new tools that are that are sort of can be a detriment to us, but to work alongside them, you know, because I don't think it's going anywhere. And that can be sort of disheartening for some, some artists and creatives. Um, but I think because it's not going anywhere, we may want to consider ways to incorporate it, you know, tastefully. That's a fair point. Very insightful. All right, so we're almost out of time. So I just want to ask you, I, I have one more question prepared for you and then I'll give you the floor. Uh, so what are your upcoming sound font projects? I mean, as we previously said, I know you're working on something based on Silent Hill 2, but is there anything else coming up in the, pi in the general pipeline we should know about? Yeah, well, of course, there's the Silent Hill 2. I'm very excited about that. Um, a couple others that I have in the works, I guess I can spoil them. Um, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Ooh. Yeah, that one's, that one's, it's a project, but, uh, it's turning out really well so far. Um, also the Mega Man X titles from the PlayStation one era. Um, I have those in the works as well. And Metal Gear Solid two. I mean, the, the Mega Man X PlayStation titles, I particularly perked up on. Those are maybe my favorite soundtrack from video games. At least top three. They're amazing. One. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and there's this great, great taste. Oh, there's this great channel I found on YouTube called The Greatest Darn. They actually like have a whole YouTube series about documenting all the roll in patches and, 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 uh, you know, JV patches and such that were used for those soundtracks. And like they do, do like investigation on like all the people who were credited properly. I, it's fantastic. Highly recommend. Wow. Yeah, I would definitely be interested in seeing that. But okay, um, that's everything I had prepared. Is there, uh, before we end the call, is there anything else you'd like to leave off on? Um, yeah, just thanks very much for having me. It's great to get a chance to, uh, to talk about something that, you know, I'm enthusiastic about and uh, seems like you are too. <laughs> of course. All right. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. See you, everyone. Bye-bye.